earlier on today, we tried a little bit of an experiment. Vestas 11th Hour Racing connected live with us as their onboard reporter launched the drone and navigator Simon Fisher gave us a tour of the conditions around the boat, the sails, how it was that they were set up and how it was that they were continuing to push ahead with the lead. It's a little bit of a treat, a little bit of a test of the technology to see whether it worked and all the footage is still up on our social media channels if you want to go and check it out. We're going to endeavor to bring you more moments like that from the water whenever we can, including crossing our fingers each and every time when we know that the OBR has managed to get the drone safely back on board, landing it back onto the deck and rejoining the crew. Now we're going to be hearing more from Simon Fisher and the sailors on board Vesta Salimuth Hour Racing. Plus, we're going to be checking in with Mafray, some important news about what's going on there. Also, Sun Hunkai Scallywag with a few miles to make up. Plus, Conrad Coleman is going to be joining me in a few moments to talk about the race ahead. But before we do all that, let's remind ourselves about our competition. We had a unique poster signed by the seven skippers of the race for you to win. All you had to do was guess which boat was going to be the first boat to cross the equator, on which day and at which time. Well, I can tell you that Vestas, earlier on today at 10.39.40 UTC, Vestas Limith Hour Racing were the first to cross the equator. We're going to find out who got the guests the closest, and we're going to let you know in the next couple of days. So, for now, let's go back to the race course. Let's check in with Simon Fisher, the navigator. But first of all, let's take a look at where we are on the water right now with our live positions. Vestas, 11th hour racing, sitting to the north at the moment, just ahead of Team Brunel. And they're looking quite strong at the moment. Team Brunel behind them, a few miles to make up. But we know that these three boats have thin but still visual connection between each other. Take a look at what's happening, though, out to the other side. Team Axanabel and Dongfong Race Team, they are the boat furthest over in the western side. And then behind them, looking even further back as well, we still have two teams. Well, Mafre certainly are still a real contender in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. They're in second place on the scoreboard overall, but only one point behind. And then Sun Hunkai Scallywag a little way behind them. But let's check in with the leader and hear from Simon Fisher, the navigator on board Vesta Salimithau Racing. And before we came on air, I asked him what it was like having these drones flying about your head and how impressive it was that the OBRs were managed to get them back in some pretty tough conditions. It definitely takes a bit of skill. The, uh, the guys are usually stood at the back of the boat trying to fly in and then, and then catching it without getting their hands caught up in the propellers. And uh, there's also a point where sometimes the drone decides it's getting a bit close to land and doesn't want to land and tries to take off again. So the OVRs end up wrestling on the back of the boat. But uh, no, they're, they're certainly, certainly becoming pretty skilled pilots. Well, let's talk about the big news of the day. You guys in the lead and looking pretty good. We're very, very happy with where we're positioned. We're, we're pleased that we're uh, a little bit bow forward on the guys that sort of chose a more westerly or easterly path. And we've got Turn the Tide and uh, Brunel just, just to leeward. So uh, they're pretty close. We can see them and, uh, and they're pushing us hard and keeping us honest. So, uh, yeah, we've certainly got a good race on our hands right now. What do you think is going to make the difference over the next one or two days looking ahead? I think really it's, it's you know it's going to be about sailing the boat fast and, and and you know making the most and and being on top of the changing conditions and also just being a little bit smart about the clouds. We've had a lot of clouds and uh, especially overnight you get a lot more activity and it really does become a game of, of cat and mouse. You might be ahead and then you go through a cloud and stop and you see the guys roaring in from behind and then hopefully you get to the the new wind first and, and extend again. But uh, yeah, trying to manage the clouds is a, is a big bit of the. Uh, of dealing with the doldrums and uh, it's never easy and there's always an element of luck involved but uh, you kind of do what you can within the, the sort of range of course that you can sail and uh, and hope for the best so uh, whoever does that the best will probably come out well you know to be a certain amount of crossing our fingers and hoping for the best too but if, if we can get to the uh, the northerly trade winds before everyone else then uh, we're, we're certainly in good stead for uh, the second half of the leg. Simon Fisher, cool, calm and collected as Vestas 11th Hour Racing lead the fleet for the moment. Now, news for the big contender, Mafre, the Spanish team. They were the overall leaders. Now they're in second place, only a point behind Dongfong Race Team. But this morning, some big news. Take a little look at this. Now, the Spanish boat have had huge problems with their electronics. It's knocked out all of their instruments and they've been working hard to fix it not least trying to get their keel pump back in working order so they can sail at full speed. Okay, it's moving. That's full keel. 
entrado. Una vez hemos puesto el barco otra vez a navegar, nos hemos dado cuenta de que la PLC, que es el ordenador que mueve la quilla, no, no funciona. Entonces eh, hemos llamado a, al bote, al equipo de tierra, y, y desde el bote nos han dado una idea bastante buena, que es eh, hacer un puente en la, en la bomba eléctrica que mueve la quilla, la DC Pump. Puenteando la, la, la DC Pump y, y presionando en las válvulas del manifold que, que mueve la quilla, hemos conseguido mover la quilla de fin. El hecho de que, de que tengamos que usar este, este, usar este sistema para la quilla es una faena porque significa que uno de nosotros tendrá que estar abajo con este interruptor y este botón manejando la quilla. Ya el patrón ya no podrá desde, desde cubierta manejar la quilla, entonces si llegamos a un día que haya muchas viradas, otras luchadas, eh, va a ser bastante problemático porque, porque tenemos un tiempo en su cubierta y el, y el que maneja la guía, que es el patrón, no va a poder hacerlo. Entonces, bueno. Just got a really bad skid through, or really bad 20 mile loss on the leaders, so, uh, yeah, another bad one, but we had some really bad clouds for, you know, three quarters of that six hour skid, so hopefully those clouds go down to them and, and we can get, get one back now. We're just starting to move again, so it's all good. Yeah, we're certainly getting, um, Some good practice sailing by ourselves at the moment, uh, but you know we're still pushing. Well, since Mafre have fixed their keel, they have been making up miles, eight in total in the last few hours. Now the tracker is live, but this has been the movement on the fleet over the last 24 hours. As we were saying earlier, Vestas 11th Hour Racing, they are the race leaders right now, with Team Brunel and Turn the Tide on Plastic just behind them on the race course. And then behind them, Sun Hunkai Scallywag. I caught up with Luke Parkinson on board before we came on air and, well, told him, basically, I mean, they've got some miles to make up. Yeah, we certainly do. Uh, we're behind the eight ball a little bit. Um, and we've got our work cut out for us. But uh, there's plenty of miles left and a fair bit of scope in the weather for change. So we're not, we're not down and out, that's for sure. Well, we've seen boats come back from from far behind, I mean, not least yourselves who went on to win the leg. So looking ahead, what are you looking for as opportunities? For opportunities wise, we're sort of looking towards the end of the leg where, you know, we'll have some fast sailing up through the Caribbean. And then uh, as we get closer to Newport, there's almost like a big park up in the weather files at the moment. So currently it looks like the last three days, it'll all, all be to play for whether you're first or last. And, You know, we've just got to keep pushing until we get to that point, be as fresh and as ready as we can, and look and wait for the opportunities. I'm guessing a more aggressive doldrums squeezing the fleet back together would have put a smile on your face. Yeah, you know, any compression when you're at the back is always nice uh, when you go through the doldrums, but being in this part of the world, being as far west as we are, uh, the doldrums aren't as big as some of the other legs uh, that we've, we've seen in this race, so... Uh, that opportunity hasn't been as big as what we would have maybe liked, but um, there's for sure more opportunities to come. You've carved out a reputation for being a boat that follows their own lead and uh, not afraid to break away at all. The next few days, though, doesn't seem like it gives you a lot of options there. Um, yeah, the next few days, you know, like, it's, it's going to be a little bit tough and mentally we're just going to have to keep pushing and doing what we can. And that's when uh, having a strong team is really important and just not losing the belief. You lose the belief and um, don't have confidence in your team and who, the guys you're sailing with, then uh, you know things become a lot harder on board and um, the atmosphere can become quite negative. But at the moment, you know, everyone's still very positive on board the boat, uh, which is really good. And we're, we're looking for the opportunities and, uh, you know, we're waiting and we know that You know, being at the back, there's probably only going to be one or two opportunities, and we've really got to capitalise when those when those come forward. And clearly working hard as well. We see some activity on deck. Talk us through what's happening. Yeah, so at the moment we're just passing through this uh, bit of a rain cloud, so we've had uh, the breeze has gone left a little bit, and uh, so we've been headed, which has been quite nice. We've been on course and, you know, doing 13 knots, which is probably the, the quickest we've been this for this watch um, and then as we pass through the rain cloud the breeze starts to go back behind us again goes further right so we've just deployed our J2 staysail uh, which helps us go a little bit further downwind stays on course but also keeps the speed up a little bit. Luke Parkinson on board Sunukai Scallywag being 
pretty pragmatic about what they have to do. And we know that you cannot rule that boat out at all. And to help us understand exactly how they're going to get themselves back into the race, I've got Conrad Coleman here. So Sunil Kai Scallywag and Matt Frey as well, they've got some miles to make up. So looking ahead, what kind of tactical options are there for them to get their teeth into? Well, very few, actually, because right now they're in the middle of the doldrums, basically, now that they've gone across the equator. And we've heard some of the sailors talk about the, the sort of cloud action, the thermal action, that so quite unstable winds. We're seeing lots of squiggles on the tracker, more or less. But I'll just draw your attention to the live tracker that you can go and check out uh, right now. I'm looking over my shoulder at the boat speeds live. We've got Dongfeng race team down at eight knots, but everybody else is at 9.5 or 10 knots. And so if they're in the middle of the doldrums and they're all doing 10 knots, basically, then you know, it's not so bad. Let's have a look at what's coming up, however, to see if they've got anything uh, that, that uh, on the horizon that can help them out as well. And the answer is uh, no. Basically, uh, you can see that there's this high pressure zone that is totally dominating the North Atlantic area. And so very consistent wind all the way across you can see the fleet here approaching uh, the edge of Newport. This is potentially where things get ex exciting because you've got a jibe um, in towards Newport. But basically, this is two and a half thousand miles without doing maneuvers. Just sail changes uh, all the time on starboard jibe. Now, to look at this in another way, let's have a look at, at this uh, little graph that I've, I've set up here for you. This is from Squid. This is from the program that all of the sailors are using on board the boats to download the weather. So you can see the unstable winds here where they are now, and then it quickly builds basically up to 21 knots uh, there, there or thereabouts. So that's the wind speed uh, down, down here in blue, and then the boat speed down here in red. So as you can see, from the middle of today all the way through the week and then into the middle of Saturday, then you've got 20 knots of wind on a, on a reach or a broad reach. So not too many tactical options. Finally, a little bit of action here and towards the approach uh, at, at Newport that may get a little bit, bit tricky. Uh, but basically, it's all down to pure speed and focusing on the small details and the way you set the boat up. OK, well. I want to sort of illustrate this point a little bit about just how tough this battle is going to be and what kind of skills, as you say, it's going to come down to those little adjustments. I, I want to ask you a little bit of a question. Now, I warned Conrad that I was going to be asking him about this. Uh, a little bit of a chance to have a sort of fantasy sports team. If I was going to put you on one of these boats as watch captain, uh, and then I was going to give you the chance to pick any three sailors from any of the boats in any of the positions across the entire fleet, you pick three, that rounds out your watch to four, and that's what we've seen the other teams doing. So if you could pick three sailors, who would you pick? Why? What skills do you think are going to be paying off? Well, let me break down the skills that I would be looking for. Basically, we've got a really intense leg, battle, boat on boat, boat speed, no great tactical options um, remaining uh, for, for this leg up until that, that sort of tricky approach. So it's all going to come down to the way that you set the boat up. And so I'd be looking for a lot of intensity, a lot of, well, somebody who, who's in tune with the way the boat is set up. So I'd be looking for a small boat Olympic sailor. Uh, then pretty quickly, I would be looking for one of the French sailors who has done the Figaro. Now, the Figaro series is a one design, so it matches up with um, with a sort of mentality. So it's a one design solo offshore series uh, that happens every year that's got a very, very intense leg. You know, you can be sailing uh, for days and days and days and have five boats finish in 10 seconds. It's completely absurd. But what that means is that anybody coming out of that circuit has got um, the, the habit of driving themselves hard, of looking at the tiniest little details and hanging on when you've got a boat always in sight. Um, so let's have a look at my picks. First up is the guy that won this leg in the last edition of the race. Uh, Charles Quadrolier, he's on his third Volvo Ocean race, and so has got plenty of experience. And he's an all-rounder. He's done everything because he was a Figaro sailor like Nico Lundvin. Now, he is a two-time Figaro champion. He's won it twice, and he won it last year. So he is on a hot streak right now. Lots of performance analysis capabilities as well, which would marry up really well with Francesca Klepsic. Now, she's done the Olympics twice. The last time was in the 49er FX, and so she's got a lot of experience in setting up a boat that planes on a reach. Okay, now, 
I, I, no one can really pick holes in those three sailors. Three top sailors, of course. I mean, Nico Lundvin, you've got to give him his dues. Over the last week, he's been making tactical moves that have put the rest of the fleet to shame, gaining on every shift that's out there. But I'm wondering whether you're missing a little something here, because at this point in the legs, we know that the sailors are tired, but we know the boats are tired as well. And have a little look at this footage here. I mean, this is pretty indicative of the footage that we get in here every week. Abby Ela on board Team Brunel, always able to spot what needs working on the boat, what needs fixing, and also being able to solve the problem. So far, I don't think there's been an issue that she hasn't been able to find a workaround, be it hardware, be it sales, be it electronics. At this point, when we know the equipment's getting a little bit tired, why not Abby Ela or at least someone with her kind of skills? Well, I'll, I'll give you that, because we did just see uh, footage of Nettie or uh, Antonio Cuevas Mons uh, working on the electrical system on board Mafre, so I, I can understand that can be important. But let two elements that go into that. Uh, first off, the boats have just come out of a massive refit at Itajai. They were ripped apart after the Southern Ocean. They were put back together. Last week, we had uh, the boatyard uh, manager uh, talking about that in, in great detail. And so I reckon the boats are actually in pretty good shape. Uh, and then also, we've got maximum of 20 gusting, maybe 25 knots for the next week. I don't think that breakdowns are going to make or break this leg. Okay, you're betting against that one, but, but how about this? How about something that we have seen? Have a little look at this. This is some highlights from the tracker. The amount of jibes that we've seen over the last two, three days. I mean, I haven't even been able to bring myself to count all these maneuvers that we're seeing ticking off here. And every single one of these jibes means the stack has to move from left to right, from right to left. Sails need to be brought over, personal equipment, whether you're tired, whether you're awake, whether you're cold, whether you're hungry, it all needs to be done. We're talking unbelievable physical effort. I mean, my mind goes straight to people like um, Federico de Mello, uh, Carlo Hussman mm -hmm. as well. I mean, big powerhouses. Where's your power gonna come from? Well, the answer is, uh, was at the end of my pick. Basically, I don't think that this is going to be beefcake sailing, you know, that it all is going to come down to the, the little details. Now, and that's why I, I, um, I put Francesca Klapsic in my, in my rundown, uh, because she, she's an Olympic sailor. She's very, very tuned into the way the boat is set up and the way it's been rebalanced. Uh, and when it comes to power, nice that you brought that up, because I uh, encourage you to go and have a look at her, her social media and her Instagram. It's full of incredible photos from this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, a little behind the, um, the scenes peak. But check this out here. She used to work here close to Alicante as a CrossFit instructor, and so she is massively powerful. So if you're looking for power, there's going to be almost nobody else in the fleet that is as strong as she is and is used to picking up weights and putting them down. So if you want to stack, she's the woman you're looking for. And I tell you what, I mean, one thing as well with Francesca, we do see quite a lot. She does do it with a smile. She does. You know, that she's got, um, even when she's been sprayed in the face, and we saw this in the Southern Ocean in the previous league, you know, she's got a lovely personality and really high performance. So you've got high performance, high power, and a lovely personality topic. All right, well, there you go. So good temperament, plenty of you know, physical power in your three, plenty of skills as well, and plenty of attention to detail. But who has Conrad missed? What problems did I not see in his pick? If you think you could do a little bit better, comment on the video below. Follow us this week. We're going to be discussing it. We're going to be keeping an eye on which sailors we think are performing well out in the water. And see if you can do better if you had to pick your top three to join you out in the water for this leg of the Volvo Ocean Race. Now then, a quick reminder about our competition. Vesta Salimathar Racing was the first boat to cross the equator. They did so today. The official time coming from the race experts was 10.39.40 UTC. If you guessed that or there or thereabouts, you could be hearing from us in the next few days. We haven't yet had a chance to go through all the entries, but we will get into that pretty soon, I can promise you. Well then, there we go. That is what we think is happening on the race course right now. Are Maffrey going to be able to charge their way back up through the field now that they've got their electronics and their keel pump working? Will Sun Hunkai Scallywag bait their time and then pounce just as we get to that finish line? Will Turn the Tide on Plastic be able to reclaim the top spot from Vestas Labyrinth Hour Racing? Or is it all going to come for nothing as the Chinese team, Dongfeng Race Team, out on the west, just spoons around the opposition. We're going to be back tomorrow with a quick fix, and then at 1300 UDC, another daily show. See you tomorrow.